Hi, I'm Phil Hill, and this is Michael Feldstein. And welcome back to eLiterate TV. Over the past two years, the emergence of MOOCs in the popular discussions within higher education has been a very polarizing event. People tend to come into the conversation with either a love them or hate them kind of attitude. And while the differences behind these attitudes are real and important and need to be recognized, getting underneath them and looking at the fundamental debate reveals a much more complex picture. Recently, Phil and I were at the 2013 MOOC Research Initiative Conference, and we were able to talk to notable MOOC enthusiast Keith Devlin and notable MOOC skeptic Jonathan Rees. Now, it would be very easy to caricature these two guys and fit the stereotype of the kind of food fight that we see in MOOC debates. Keith is a superstar professor from Stanford, frequent speaker on public radio, and just generally well-known and charming guy. Jonathan is also an interesting and charming guy who's known for his advocacy of faculty labor issues at Colorado State University where he works as a historian of technology. But if you scratch the surface a little bit, you'll find out that these guys' stories and their perspectives are a little more complex than you might imagine. Keith grew up in a working class family and is passionate about issues of educational access. Jonathan is hardly a Luddite, having used blogs and wikis and other technologies in his own teaching. We're going to have an opportunity to hear from both of these guys where they differ, but also where they agree. Keith, you've been involved in MOOCs for a little while now. You... Well, in, from a Stanford perspective, I'm one of the, the early adopters. Yes, I gave my first MOOC about two months after Coursera became an independent company. It was on the Coursera platform. And what attracted you to that? Um, I've spent most of my career doing science outreach, I've done, I'm the math guy in NPR, I write for newspapers, magazines, when, when MOOCs were being developed, when the platform was being developed, a new platform, what became Coursera and Udacity, when that was being developed at Stanford, I was interested in the fact that that was coming along and I always said to myself, when that's ready, I want to try that and see if I can reach a different audience. I've got this evangelical urge to sort of get the word about mathematics out to a general community. And when it was coming out, I... I just sort of said, I want to give one of these things. By then, in fact, there was a huge velocity and Coursera was almost a company. And so by the time I put my course together, Coursera did exist and that was my platform. But it was just this urge to try and take the word about mathematics to a broader community than the various communities I'd hitherto reached. You're in the field of history. How have you gotten into the whole world of educational technology and then therefore into what MOOCs are and are not? There's a, a lot of educational technology that's being done in history, and I got into it because I was interested in doing it in my own classroom. But I developed some concerns based primarily, I think, on my, my work with the Colorado AAUP. I'm worried about uh, what it's going to be like for other historians who come after me, mm -hmm. whether they can get employment and what their classrooms are going to be like. At one point, someone from my university asked me if I wanted to teach online. I didn't know much about it. And it sort of disturbed me because it seemed as if the standards weren't nearly as good as they should be. And I started blogging about it because I wanted other faculty like me <laughs> to know what was going on. And I'm, I'm, so I've been trying to raise awareness for some time now. So that's an interesting perspective uh, to, to come to your teaching with an evangelical urge. Is that uh, what you think MOOCs are particularly good at? Uh, I, think they have, I think they have huge potential. Okay. Um, and I'm doing what most of us do. I'm extrapolating from a sample of one, which is me. <laughs> I'm, I'm doing MOOCs. I'm at Stanford. Because when I was a kid, I was turned on by academics who were writing popular books on mathematics and science. Mm. It was the 1950s science popularizers that made me aware of science and mathematics and stimulated me to become a mathematician because the regular systems weren't reaching someone like me. There were schools, there was a, the schools were pretty good, but it wasn't geared towards me. England in those days was geared towards the Oxford and Cambridge people that were sort of birthrighted into that. And I was reached by these other people. And I've always felt that if we can offer that opportunity, I don't care if the success rate is, is one out of a hundred, give me a chance to reach that one out of a hundred and I'll go for it because that's how you can change lives, and if you can change enough lives, you can change society. If you have a lot of technical knowledge or you're willing to learn it, and there's a lot of money available to you, you can teach online history really well and learn fantastic stuff. 
and I teach fantastic stuff, but if there's uh, an environment where you don't have a lot of money and people are trying to do it on the cheap, then there's going to be real serious both historical and pedag pedagogical problems with what you're creating. Sure. And my, my problem with MOOCs, not all MOOCs, but certainly the way that MOOCs were originally pitched as these great cost savers is that it seemed like the bad side of online education all over again to me. And so I've been trying to learn about it and telling others so that we can uh, turn the bad online education into the good online education. So let's say I'm a faculty member. I haven't done a MOOC before. I don't know much about MOOCs. Maybe the idea of the evangelical urge appeals to me, but maybe also this idea that MOOCs could upend everything makes me a little nervous. Mm -hmm. What do you say to that faculty member about how they should think about MOOCs and approach them? If you're a faculty member, you should very much be interested in upending everything. Because if society's paying you, one way or another, a pretty good salary to sit back and think about the future of, the, of society, then that's what we should be doing. It's our job to rattle the change that way and to look for new things. We are given the privilege of thinking about the future. That is one of the things we do. We preserve the past, we curate the present, and then we, we think about the future. So, first of all, that's what we should be doing. Um, we certainly should not be worried about the negative effects. Um, and we definitely shouldn't be worried about losing our own jobs. Very few people in society have that privilege, and I don't think we should have that either, quite frankly. We should be doing research because that's what we are paid to do and that's what we've chosen to do. You want to avoid an automated education where the idea of a college education is to look at something on the screen and then they will do all your teaching for you. I think there's a lot of value to close contact with a professor. You can have that close contact online if your class isn't too big. You can't have that with 30,000 people. The kinds of things that historians do, good history professors do, cannot be done with 30,000 people or 80,000 people, or really, just to be fair, even four or 500 people. Okay. Um, you want to be able to you know, look at people's writing. You want to be able to critique it as somebody who writes yourself. Uh, you want to be able to have conversations in order to get students to get to their own opinions about history rather than saying, you know, here's a video of the Kennedy assassination, go watch it, mm -hmm. and poof, you learned about the Kennedy assassination. What parts are scalable and how can you take away the stuff that can be done in a MOOC or some other medium and free up the time of the experts? Because when it comes down to it, education is about what people do when they get together. Really, it comes down to two people. Now, those, the two might be spread one to 20 or one to 25, but the real learning takes place when two eyes make contact and there's an interaction and something happens. So that is not scalable. But we can make that happen more often by scaling up the stuff that can be scaled. The lecture, for example, which essentially is a medieval photocopy machine, it was the only way to get man many copies of a handwritten manuscript, how the lecture survived the photocopy machine and everything else beats me. I suspect the standard one hour lecture has finally been killed off or is about to be killed off by MOOCs and quite frankly good riddance. But boy, that means we can have more research seminars. We can have more close knit conversations because that's when learning takes place. MOOCs offer huge potential in their present form to produce greater efficiencies. But even more exciting, they offer the potential to give teachers and learners much better chances to interact. So I see this as an opportunity to making education much better, not making it much cheaper. The problem would be if we sort of blindly apply scaling technologies yeah. to automate um, teaching, if you will, yeah. and lose the direct connection of faculty with a small number of students in some way. That's really where would be the danger. I think it's particularly important with history because everybody thinks because they, you tended to have bad high school teachers, that history is all about content. If you can date the Kennedy assassination, you know history. If you can date World War II, you know history. But that's only the building blocks of history. History is not just knowing when things happened, it's knowing what to do with that information and how that's gonna inform your world. And sort of direct guidance from a professor is what makes that kind of teaching possible. English is sort of the same way, except instead of historical facts, you're dealing with literature and writing, the writing skills in both disciplines are exactly the same. So while you know, MOOCs may work, I won't even concede this because I know nothing about computer science, but they may work in a computer science environment where all you need to do is code. I'm really suspicious of the idea of applying them mindlessly to the humanities. 
sure. and probably a few other disciplines I don't know that much about. We've got this global community from countries that are in, in conflict at various stages who for 10 weeks come together with a very clear shared purpose. They've got a challenge. For most of them, you cannot get through that challenge if you don't collaborate with others. And they have to collaborate and exchange ideas. So I spend, when the course is running, I'm on those discussion forums for many hours. I could sit back and let the people living it come in. And that happens time and time again. You bring up a topic and in a class of, I had a real class of about 10,000 students who were genuine students. 60,000 signed up, 10,000 were real students. They were there throughout the whole time. In that class, you have an enormous cross-section, not only of the world, but of different people in the world, from high school students to people, members of government. That brings these perspectives together. And, you know, I don't know for sure, but my guess is in the discussions, I had people from various parts of the world who typically would be opponents um, because they would be politically on, on, on one side or another of a divide. What brought them together was trying to master, in my case, mathematical thinking. I think not only is that a great use of, of MOOCs, but it's a great use of mathematics. It's bringing people together. And that's one of the things I think MOOCs are going to do. They are going to bring the world closer together. And how could anybody argue with that? As I understand, you're certainly not a Luddite. You actually yeah. do explore technology and where it applies in the oh, classroom. Oh, ab absolutely. So where yeah. would um, some of the online technology and MOOC-specific technology, where does it apply, if anywhere? I have sort of a professor-centered vision of educational technology. I think the best thing that educational technology providers could do would be to offer a buffet. Here's this tool, here's this tool, here's this tool. Uh -huh. And you can have the ones you like, and yeah. you will just ignore the ones that you don't like. Yeah. And so, for instance, um, I have a wiki in one of my classes. Uh, I have blogs in a few of my classes, and I love this stuff. It allows me to teach complicated history differently. I wrote an article about teaching history with YouTube. That was five years ago. Um, and so I, you know, break up my lectures with foam. Yeah. And these are great things to me. They match the way I teach. I'm glad to be able to do it. And I try to tell others so that if they want to take it, they'll take it as a tool they can use too. But if you simply say, here's your MOOC, this is the way this course will be taught forever, um, then I think that's a problem. Gotcha. I worry about the academic freedom of the professors who are being asked to flip their classes with other people's MOOCs. I worry about shared governance on campuses where uh, provosts and presidents are getting probably a little too interested in sure. education technology. And I'm, I'm really here to sort of voice those concerns so that the people who are trying to plan our educational technology future take them into account. One thing that we saw in these two conversations is Keith took a view that was quite evangelical and how do you reach out to students who haven't had access to this type of education before and even saying it was the professor's obligation to research and don't worry too much about your job. At the same time, Jonathan looked at it from the other side and said, well, what is going to happen to future scholars? What does this mean for professors being able to get jobs and keeping the scholarship moving in the future? Now, both of these guys are concerned about quality. And both of them agree that part of education really comes down to one person talking to another. And that part does not scale. It's just that where Keith sees opportunity in the part that he thinks does scale, like bringing together people from all over the world and having conversations that you can't have in a small Stanford face-to-face -face classroom. Jonathan worries that the hype that we've been having in the last year or two about MOOCs being the ultimate answer to the future of education will enable us to gloss over the parts that don't work and that we'll lose something precious about the way college education in America works today. Now, both of the full video interviews are available as transmedia elements within the Telling Story player. Now, chances are, as you came into this, you identified with one side or the other. But Keith and Jonathan really were starting a virtual conversation. So as you come into it, what questions would you have of them? Or what comments would you have? 